machine translation. In this lecture, because in last lecture I realized that I I have cut away too many details and then we have like 15 minutes free at the end of the two lectures, then now I have tried to put a bit more of details, uh, hopefully ho hoping that that's going to be useful. So let's see if I manage to give everything on time. But yeah. Okay, so uh, trying to link what I'm going to talk about now with the general a theory or the general problem and technology of neural networks. So you realize that uh, several, at the very first lecture, we were talking about why neural networks, if they have been around since the 80s and earlier, why now they suddenly are the most uh, useful or the most powerful algorithm in most applications. And the three main reasons that most people uh, talk about, and there will be some people that don't agree with me or might add on or drop some other one, is that data, thanks to the internet mainly, uh, is much richer now. The other one is that hardware, especially to the uh, graphical processing units and to how much we like video games, hardware now is uh, exceptionally good. It is a couple of our, uh, orders of magnitude faster than, than CPUs. And then software. And software is the most interesting one and the one where this course and similar courses focus uh, on. And on the software side, the, the side or the part of the algorithmic technology that was most important to solve or that was most damaging the performance of traditional neural networks is the one that we are going to explain today, which is vanishing and exploding gradients. So some people decades ago realized that if you look at how the gradients backpropagate in typical neural networks, and this happen, happens as well in the modern neural networks, then the gradients tend to become lower and lower as you backpropagate them from layer to layer. So in the output layers, the gradients are big and they have sensible numbers, but as you go to layers closer to the input, the gradients start to become lower and lower. And as a result, layers near to the output, they learn very quickly and the others don't learn much. And what this will result on is that in traditional neural networks, uh, the problem will get to the point that the first layer will learn any, nothing and the top layers will simply learn to try to deal with the random uh, linear, non-linear projections that the first layers do, uh, you will try to deal with it to try to predict anything, uh, even after you introduce all those layers of noise. Uh, so the, the first layers will simply introduce noise because they don't learn, they didn't learn, uh, and, and that was the reason why more than a couple of layers didn't do anything extra in traditional neural networks. And now, during, since 2010s, or uh, depending on who you ask, but in the last decade, they have uh, been able to figure out a number of tricks to improve or ameliorate the problem of vanishing and, uh, and exploding gradients, May, mainly uh, vanishing gradients. But the, um, the ones, or the most important ones that really uh, solve more centrally this problem, or more purely this problem, are uh, <laughs> gradient clipping to solve the problem of, explo of exploding gradients and LSTMs and GRUs and other architectures which are modifications of the recur uh, recurrent neural network uh, that uh, create a memory test. What, what I call, because really that, that's what it is, a super hidden uh, state in the recursive neural network. Okay, so let, let's examine why the problem of vanishing and, and exploding gradients uh, happen. So the thing is that if you look at several steps of a uh, uh, recurrent neural network, this is a neural network, so in reality the neural network is only this, with this W feeding to itself, but we have unfolded it in time, uh, as in, in four different time steps, which is what we always do in the backpropagation through time algorithm. And the thing is that if you start analyzing what is, so how much the loss of the, uh, of the uh, final output depends on the hidden state from several states ago, from several steps ago. What you realize is that you calculate it, so that's the, how much the final gradient change 
with respect to the hidden state of the first step. And if you apply backpropagation or the chain rule, you start, you, you see that uh, it unfolds into that. Then the second element, if you apply again chain rule there, it unfolds again into the, another one and then unfolds into another one up to when we arrive to the final step. So in the end, the gradient or how much the loss uh, depends or changes according to the first state is actually a multiplication of many derivatives, as many derivatives as there are steps in the, in the computation, uh, and at the end we have finally the derivative of the, or the gradient of the loss with respect to the final state. And this is, these multiplications, if you remember, these gradients are the ones that backpropagate in a neural network or backpropagate in, a, uh, in the backpropagation through time. Uh, and if you generalize it, well, here uh, it is what I just said. So the problem starts, before I go to gener general, equa general equation, so here the problem starts uh, with the fact that these gradients tend to be quite small they tend to be lower than one. And if you, or sometimes they are higher than one, but the problem is that with multiplications, if you apply a multiplication over and over and over again to the same number, because all these gradients end up being the same, so all these gradients end up being W multiplied by the derivative of the transfer function, because the transformation that we apply in every step is exactly the same, so in the end, what we are doing is getting the same number and multiply it over and over again, multiplying it as many times as the steps there are in the, in, the, in the recurrent neural network. What happens with that recurrent multiplication is that if this derivative is slightly lower than one, then it will quite quickly tend to zero. Because if you multiply 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, you have 0 0.25. If you multiply it by 0 0.5 again, it goes to 0 0.15, whatever, or 12, whatever. If you multiply it again, it goes to 0, 0, 6, and like that. So you see that it goes down very quickly. And if it is, if the number, the derivative, is slightly above 1, then the, the, it will start growing exponentially as well. 2 multiplied by 2, 4, then 8, then 16, then whatever, up to in 10 steps you have 1024. So you see very quickly what was the problem. And that doesn't only happen in the four steps example that we are talking about. If we generalize the equation, this one might be a bit the harder step to digest, but it is simply what he, we are doing here is the equation that we had before. We generalize it to rather than having only four steps, we have n number of steps. The last step, we call it with i for indigo. And the older step, where we are trying to calculate the derivative, uh, we call it j, j for junkie, for example. And then what you get is that this derivative, the derivative of a hidden state with regards to the previous hidden state, for all the intermediate states between i for indigo and j for junkie, uh, get multiplied over and over again. If these derivatives were different, and they were random numbers with mean equal to 1, it would be OK. But the problem is that because it is a recurrent neural network, the value of this derivative is a, or it is not always the same, but it has a couple of elements that are always the same. So this is uh, the, the how the new hidden state depends on the previous one. If you apply the derivative here to calculate this element, you apply the chain rule inside, so you have the derivative of the sigmoidal or the derivative of whichever transfer function, but in all times it was always sigmoidal multiply by wh, because in the chain rule you get all this stuff outside, you derivate by this guy, and then everything disappears except for h, uh, wh. Then, if you apply this equation to here, you, you plug it inside and, uh, well, yeah, they, they don't, you don't even need to change variables. The variables already have the same, the t has already the same uh, letter on there. You plug it here inside, and what you see very quickly is that in all the steps, this h 
WI is, is exactly the same because it is a recurrent neural network. It always applies the mean in the same implication. And this derivative, well, there is another funny thing with this, the derivative of the sigmoidal. But the most important one that is more, more difficult to get rid of is this W. Because this W, if there is a difference of 10 steps, uh, then you apply 10 times. In an example of W equal to 2, you get 1024. In an example, example of W equal to 0 0.5, you get the result is 0 0.000, whatever. And as with W, the other problem that we have in this equation is this uh, derivative of the sigmoid. And the problem with the sigmoid is that its derivatives for all the domain of the, of the sigmoid are always below that uh, much lower than 1. So if you plot the sigmoid, you have this stuff. So the, for all the area of the domain higher than one or whatever, this is the derivative is uh, almost zero because there is no uh, slope. And the derivative for anything below minus one is always almost zero. And if you go here to the center, here in the central point, Let's draw this a little bit better. So when the domain is equal to 0, here the, the, the derivative is only 0 0.5. Or not 0 0.5, I think it is 0 0.5. But anyway, yeah, we can calculate it later. The important thing is that it is lower than, uh, than 1. Uh, and this is only in the maximum point of the derivative of the domain. Uh, as soon as you go a little bit further from it, this starts being much lower than 1. So we have a double problem. We have that we multiply a number, either smaller or lower, larger than 1, many, many times, as many times as intermediate steps. And then we apply this other number. We multiply it over and over again. This number will change from step to step. But in all the steps, it is going to be below 0.5. So we, we, are, we are fostering in vanishing gradients very quickly and a bit of uh, exploding gradients. And well, what I am saying here is, is the same. So we only, when W is higher than 1, you get exploding gradients. When it is lower, you get vanishing gradients. Uh, and any questions so far? Because I realize one of the feedback I, I got is that I start rambling a lot and I don't ask a So how, how is it going? Any question about, uh, about yes? Yes, the sigmoid. Yes, so this diagonal, so your question is about the diagonal? Uh, oh. Yeah, like how the graph indicates where, like, mm. uh, like what it's representing. Yes, so it is representing this sigmoid. So this little, I think this was delta or rho? Well, anyway, uh, imagine that it is delta. That delta is the, the symbol for the transfer function. And traditionally, now there are other transfer functions, but traditionally, the transfer function was a sigmoid. And the thing is that uh, in the sigmoid, so the domain goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, and the range, do we have some other, oh, we don't have more things. Well, I will use this half line green one. Uh, in the range, uh, it goes only from plus one to zero, but the derivative here, the, if you apply the derivative of the derivative of the, you can also write it this way, the derivative of the sigmoid with respect to the input. So this will be the input to the sigmoid. The derivative looks something like this. Okay? And this will be zero. So in the zero point, you get to the maximum, which is, I think it was 0 0.5. Uh, and as soon as you go a little bit away from zero, it, it plummets to, to zero in the, in the range very quickly. Hmm? So if you like equations, you will say that the limit of the derivative of uh, the sigmoid with respect to x plus minus infinity this grows to zero. And this happens very, very quickly. You don't need to go very far 
le infinity del good lead. You get to the limit zero very quickly. And the input of that sigmoid, it could be anywhere. So when you are learning, when the neural network is learning, uh, the gradient, the backpropagated back gradient will naturally push the activity of H, of the hidden state, a away from the, from the central point. So even if at the beginning, when you initialize the neural network, there isn't uh, many of the hidden states, um, or there are many hidden states near to zero, uh, they will tend to go away from zero quite, uh, quite easily. Was that uh, clear? Yeah. Good, perfect, perfect, yes. Which one? Which one? T I. This one? Ah, the, this is the di diagonal. So that's because these W's, because uh, we have written this with a vector or matrix notation. I would like to have used uh, my, my funny notation with the brackets to say the size of every vector and every matrix in the equation. But actually, the size, this H, is a vector. Uh, with as many elements as uh, neurons in the hidden state of the recurrent neural network. Hmm? Yes? Oh, so, uh, so th this H, it is not only a single number. It is, imagine that you are using a recurrent neural network with 10 hidden units. So it has 10 neurons inside. Or let's do it with this example. In this example, we have four neurons in, in the hidden state. So in this example, this H will have, will be a vector with four elements. And this W are all the weights that project those four neurons to the four neurons of the next step in the recurrent neural network. So that W, because H is connected everything to everything, it is a dense connection, this W is going to be a matrix with four columns and four rows. And then this, indeed, this H is a vector, a vector, a, a column matrix, or, but I usually ignore that in the, so they, they in this nomenclature, they assume that uh, the reader is going to magically know what are the dimensions. That's why I don't like too much this, uh, this nomenclature. But what you do here is that you multiply a vector, uh, a column uh, vector, by this matrix, and the result is what is going to be the addition, what is going to be the, the, the effect that the neuronal values or the neuronal activity of the previous step is going to have in the next step of the regular neural network. Yeah? And the same, so the result is going to be another column vector of all, also four elements. And here it is the same. Here imagine that, actually imagine that the input is one of those embeddings that have 200 dimensions. So then this X is going to be a column vector of 200 elements. But then this matrix is going to have 200 columns and only four rows. And when you apply the matrix multiplication, what that means is that each one of these 200 inputs is affecting by some weight inside this matrix a little bit to each one of the four neurons of the recurrent neural network. And when you apply that matrix multiplication, W with four rows, 200 columns, X a column vector of 200 rows, then you end up having a very small vector of, again, four, uh, a column vector of four elements. And this other guy, this one is uh, a column vector of four elements. It is the bias. When you sum all of these up, you have a column vector of four elements. When you apply the derivative of the sigmoid, in, if you keep using the vector nomenclature or vector calculus, you again get uh, a, a, how do you say, you again get a, a, a vector, a matrix. And then this diagonal will mean that you only want to get the diagonal elements of that matrix that you end up with. The what? Yes. I, I didn't. So what? What? what the, 
Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, and then later you multiply by this other one, and, and you get a result. Ah, I think where, where you get the matrix. So maybe where you, uh, yeah, what I didn't explain. So the input is a, a column vector, but when you apply the full derivative, the um, vectorial derivative of a vectorial function is actually a matrix. And that, that's true, that, that should be explained there. I should, I should have realized that it is not that obvious. So if you have the derivative and also the, this function, it is a vectorial function. It goes from R4, because in the same form we have four neurons, to R4. Because actually, this derivative of this function is equal to the derivative for the first hidden state so hidden state one, or neuron one, the derivative of neuron two, the derivative of neuron three, and the derivative of neuron four. Or if you want to be a bit more, uh, if you like writing, then this is going to be the derivative of the sigmoid divided by the derivative of H one of the first neuron, and so on. But when you apply the uh, derivative to a vectorial function like this one, you end up getting a matrix. Indeed, this will be, I am messing up a bit. Well, no, I'm not messing up, these are vectorials. But anyway, these derivatives, because this thing is a, is a vector, are going to end up being equal to the derivative of the first element with respect to H1, the derivative of the second element of the seed point uh, by H1, the derivative of the third element by H1 as well, by the first neuron. And here now we start again, but we change. We go with the first element of the sigmoid and derivate by the second hidden state, okay? So in every column we have uh, the output, the domain, no, the range of the sigmoid the first element, second element, third element, and in the rows we derivate by the first input, the second input, the third input, and so on. So we end up like a mat uh, with a matrix. But then this, this uh, function, this derivative, so the, the second output doesn't really depend on, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the first, on the first input. So in reality, all these end up going to zero, and you end up having only the, uh, the diagonal. Yeah? So yeah, that, that's why they have the diagonal. Uh, next year, I will, I will uh, put an extra, extra explanation of why that diagonal is there. Any other question? Huh? Okay, okay. Okay, I have to sp uh, speed up a little bit. An exploding gradient. So what, what's the problem? So we were talking that we have two versions of this problem. One of them is the vanishing gradient problem. The other one is the exploding one. So uh, the problem when gradients become very high is that if you, uh, if you visualize um, gradient or back propagation or the, if you visualize what is the effect of the update function in the in the loss function, so here you will have one parameter, then another parameter, also in reality this is going to be quite a multidimensional space. <coughs> then if you start applying one step after another, eh, if suddenly there is a region of the domain of this loss function that has very high uh, gradient, eh, the update rule is going to send the next uh, state of the parameters, of the weight of the neural network, very far away. And often, when you make such a big step, uh, you end up in a region very far away from a sensible area of the parameter space. Uh, talking a bit more theoretically, you end up outside the basin of attraction of this, uh, of this attractor, the attractor where there is the, the, uh, the global minima. Or you might even end up, if this happens a couple of times, you end up with infinite values or not a number 
or a register uh, overflow inside the hardware of the computer, so it totally messes up learning. That will be the problem with the, uh, with the exploding layers. And what uh, is the most common solution that people apply here? So it, it is very, very drastic, drastic, a bit brutal, <laughs> but quite effective. The only thing that you do is that you keep monitoring whether your gradients are going very, very high, and you put some threshold that as many other metaparameters of the neural network you play with until it works well. And if the gradient or the norm of the gradient, because this is a vector again, if the norm of the gradient is, up, uh, is going above an even threshold, then you simply clip the, the gradient, uh, you clip it so the, the vector of the gradient, you keep it in the same direction, but you reduce it until its norm is uh, exactly equal to the threshold. So it is in a vector, vector space, point of view, you are simply uh, shrinking the, uh, the gradient vector until it has this length, a length uh, equal to threshold. And all these other mathematical, small mathematical machinery simply means that you are, you, you want to keep uh, the direction of the gradient vector pointing in the same, in the same direction. So if you divide a vector by its norm, you get a unique <coughs> vector, a vector whose norm is one, but that points in the same direction than the original vector. Any other question with this? Yeah. How do you keep the it, it is a metaparameter. You play with it until it works sensibly. Um, and, and that, it is frustrating, but it, uh, that's the case with most metaparameters in, in neural networks. Yes. Yes, so the thing, if we draw it, let me see, I am going to check if we have a better marker. Give me a second. Oh yeah, we have quite a collection here. So if this is, oh, much better. If this is the vector, um, the gradient vector, uh, so this will be, uh, what nomenclature ah, okay, I am simply writing graph. So this is the gradient vector, and it is a vector itself, okay? There I am using pseudocode, and then sadly in pseudocode or in Python, you cannot write mathematical symbols. You can in Julia, which is great, but not in Python. Well, anyway, that's a vector, and then this will be the zero point or the zero vector, so this is the original space. What you measure is actually the, the norm. So if we start using a bit of, math we, we mix pseudocode with mathematical nomenclature, this will be simply the norm, the, the, the how long the, the arrow is. And then you compare this against this threshold, th. So uh, the threshold is a, is a scalar, it belongs to r only. While this gradient, it belongs to r, Mm, and as many dimensions as there are in the hidden state, or well, not in the hidden state, but rather in all the parameters of the neural network. If it is higher, then we cut it. Oh, what did I do with the cut? But anyway, uh, we, we cut it until it has exactly a norm equally to the threshold. So you will end up having the graph gradient is equal to the threshold itself. And a norm belongs to R, and the threshold belongs to R. So this, this equation makes sense. Yeah? Oh, welcome. Any other question, you can stop me in, in the middle, and, and I will uh, reply. If some of them, I, I don't know it from the top of my head, I can later consult Wikipedia and come back and look very smart by answering the question. Uh, yes, so that, that's what we do. So uh, if we don't clip gradients, we end up with this situation from time to time. If we clip them, we end up with this other result. Oh, uh, so what will happen is that when you end up in a region with very, very high gradients, 
Uh, you keep advancing the direction of maximum descent, but you don't make massively large uh, steps. And that, that uh, solves the problem quite effectively. And this one, I think, ah, yeah, and now, okay, I have talked about the exploding gradient side. Now we are going to talk about the vanishing gradient side. So what is happening with the vanishing gradient? So, as I was saying before, if you keep multiplying, uh, if to be able to get the derivative or the gradient, the, the derivative of the loss function with respect to uh, the hidden state quite several steps uh, ago, then you end up with many multiplications and they very easily go to zero. And you say, well, that, that might be okay. Simply, you keep, so the first, the top layers <coughs> near to the output are, go, are going to learn very quickly. But once they have learned perfectly, you will think that these other these other, um, the longer term relationships that are not captured uh, when you learn only with the final with the final layers or the final steps are going to start learning because those other ways are going to be stop updating. But that doesn't happen because what happens is that as this gradient starts becoming smaller and smaller, you will start having the gradient from steps that are closer to this other older step are going to really dominate the equation and are really going to, so this, this orange backpropagated gradient is going to be much larger than this other component of the gradient that you are getting from that step. And when you update this W, you are, remember that you are not applying only the gradient of the last step, usually you apply the gradient of all these different steps or, or you advance one step at a time and in every step you apply the gradient again. So what will happen is that when you update the weights of W such that the activity, the hidden states of several steps ago have an effect on the final, on the blue output, what will happen is that actually all the effect that you are able to modify or influence in H are going to end up having an impact in this other gradient, in the gradient of the step that is much closer to this one. So what is going to end up resulting is that no matter which hidden state you are uh, updating or, or are influencing by updating W, uh, that influence that you are introducing into H through the update rule is going to be simply the uh, influence that maximizes or improves the best these, uh, the loss only a couple of steps away or, or in the very same step. But uh, that influence that you are putting into H is not going to reflect what is happening with the loss several steps later. Uh, was that clear or any question? Okay, okay. Uh, and now we are going to see some examples of what happens. So, uh, this is a typical example. So you have uh, when, when a person or when I go to the shop uh, or when I am going to use the printer, I think it was, yeah. Uh, to print some tickets, there was no toner, then I went to the shop, uh, and you can write, you can modify the example in many ways. I went to the shop, I phoned a friend and do whatever, blah, 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 then I write to the shop, they didn't have, uh, didn't have toner, I went to a second shop, got, got the toner, then I went back to my house, and finally I, I was able to print what? So a person will say, well, yeah, she was able to print the tickets, because she, that's what she was doing before. But the problem in a recurrent neural network is that that tickets appears ages ago. And then the gradients, the, 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 when, when you are back propagating the gradients through so many steps, when the gradients are right to tickets, they are almost zero. So they are not going, the, the W matrix is not going to be updated in such a way that tickets can have any influence here. And then the neural network is not going to be able to, to uh, put tickets there. It is going to be, she was able to print her document, whatever is, uh, whatever is more sensible to put is if you only read the last sentence. And this is a other example in a smaller scale, uh, scale, which also happens, is that, and I think this was, yeah, this was uh, analyzed in one paper, 
then what they saw is that uh, what they saw is that if you have very simple uh, cases like <coughs> the food of the cats is whatever. So in this case. So if you have a bit of a long memory, you will realize that the verb to be here should have a, should, should, um, should match with the with this uh, singular should should be in singular case because the food is singular. But if you have very little memory and don't know what is going here, the only <coughs> subject or, or the only complement of the name that you can that you can think about is cats, and you will end up putting the, the form of the verb are. The, the plural one. And uh, linguists or the, the NLP people that want to be a bit more theoretical will talk, will uh, name this as syntactic recency and sequential recency. Syntactic recency is to get the complement of the name that is closest but that it is syntactically sensible. And sequential recency is simply to get the complement of the name in this example that in this example that is closest, and that's it. Any other example uh, about this? Uh, I mean, any any other question about these examples? Okay, okay. And okay, and now explaining a bit more the intuition. Okay. So explaining a bit more the intuition, so there are two ways of understanding the vanishing and exploding uh, gradients problem. One way is what I have been explaining so far, which is the backpropagation, the point of view of backpropagation. And the point of view of backpropagation is that when you um, apply the chain rule to the gradient of uh, the loss with respect to a very old state, you get a couple of elements, W, and uh, the derivative of the sigmoid that are, uh, well, this one is lower than one, but this one, as soon as W is higher or lower than one, it is going to go either to infinity or to zero very quickly. But you can also understand the problem. At least the vanishing gradient one, which is the most common, the most common one, the one that uh, emerges more easily, uh, from the point of view of uh, forwards, uh, forwards propagation. So you will realize that in a recurrent neural network, this hidden state, which is what will allow us to know or to relate something from several steps ago to what happens uh, now in this current state, this age keeps being modified over and over again. And to be able to keep something in age stable for many, many steps, you will need to put in this W, imagine that it is the second neuron. So in this W, the second row of the W will need to be almost everything zero, except perhaps uh, you could put a non-zero value in the column corresponding to some neuron that has privileged access to that second neuron. And for the input, it is the same. If you don't want the input to really have an effect in the second neuron, the second row of W will need to be totally zero and, and the bias as well. And it is very difficult for a neural network to, to learn something so complex, to, to, to have the gradient in so many connections pointing to the correct direction. So how do we, how do we fix this problem? And I will need to speed up a bit. So how do we fix this problem? Well, uh, the way, the concepts, the, the idea with which we can solve it is by creating what, what, uh, what is really like a super hidden state, so to speak. So it is a hidden state, which is called a memory cell, uh, which is more difficult to write on. So uh, the neural network will need to uh, go through, the, by default, the neural network cannot write really so easily. And the way you control that tightly access or writing rights to the uh, memory cell is with several gates, uh, a forget gate, an input gate, and an output gate. Well, actually, it is only the forget and the input gates, the ones that control writing. The output gate uh, controls uh, output, how the current uh, value of the cell is going to affect the output of the recurrent neural network. And then when you put it into equations, the equations might look a bit, uh, a bit confusing, but simply what you are doing is you get the previous state, state of the memory cell, 
you apply these gates, the, so these functions, transfer functions are sigmoidal. Uh, remember that activation and transfer functions, they are the same, different nomenclatures. Um, they go from 0 to 1. So when this input puts the output of the sigmoid close to 0, it means that we are uh, forgetting the, the previous uh, value on that neuron, so, so we are eliminating, so when we are putting the new value in cell memory at time step C, we are not going to use much the, the previous, uh, the cell value at the previous time points. And then this input one, what the uh, input gate also from zero to one, what it controls is how a new, uh, the, the result of a new mini layer, mini neural network layer living inside the LSTM, how the result of, of that mini layer is going to be introduced into the new cell. So if this input is all new to, uh, equal to zero, then we are not going to put anything new into the memory cell. If for some neurons this input is close to one, then whatever this new C is, whatever this internal layer is telling us, we are going to put it in that neuron. And then later, okay, so if this was all the memory cell, then later we also have a standard hidden state. Uh, that the only thing that we do is to get the value of the, uh, of the memory cell, we apply another transformation, uh, and, and we simply decide with this output that goes from zero to one, which of those values we are going to put in the hidden state, which is like a more uh, output-like or, or accessible state. Uh, so if we, uh, if we now use diagrams to explain the same, so these are some diagrams, perhaps the most famous diagrams to explain uh, complex recurrent neural networks from Colab uh, website, I think it's that one over there. Uh, and this will be, using this type of diagram, this will be the traditional recurrent neural network. We simply get the hidden state from the previous step. We apply, we concatenate it with the input, apply, well, and also multiply by W and so on, apply a transfer function and send it to the next step as the new hidden state. So what we are doing now, using this diagram with LSTM, it is doing a lot of uh, wiring here. Uh, so we get in the, the previous uh, cell state gets a certain transformation that are controlled, controlled by gates, and then later we put a new value in the hidden state according to the value of the cell, and those two things go to the next step. And now we go here uh, a bit of explanation later as, uh, as lecture notes uh, for when you are studying after the lecture. Uh, and now let's analyze again using the diagram what I was talking about before a bit more quickly. So we have the cell, the memory cell, which is kind of a super hidden state. You realize that it goes straight through the, through the LSTM. Uh, and then if you, the only way to manipulate them is by putting ones into these sigmoidal elements. So the, the neural network, for the neural network, it is not so super easy to write on it. The neural network can easily decide, I want, I don't want to uh, put any value here. Then the forget gate, the only thing that it does is that it gets, it concatenates the previous hidden state and the new input, uh, makes some uh, linear transformation with, uh, with a weight matrix, uh, puts it through a sigmoidal, uh, sigmoidal transfer function and the result from zero to one multiplies it with the cell. Uh, for the outputs that are near to zero, it erases the previous cell, oh, wait a minute, erases the previous memory cell. If it is close to, to, uh, to one, then it doesn't, it doesn't erase it. It allows the cell state to remain. Uh, then, and then the next uh, input gate. So the input gate is like a, a double gate. It is uh, later when we talk about attention because this is a kind of really internal attention. So this is like another type of attention that I think they call it multiplicative or additive. I don't know. Next lecture, uh, we will see the nomenclature. So what you simply do is you have two different gates. In, ga in the sigmoidal gate, you do like in the for gate. So you decide when you are going to input stuff in the, in the memory cell. Uh, and I mean when, because you only decide between zero and one. Uh, you, you cannot really widely modify the value. You can only decide whether you are going to put something in or, or not. 
Then the tangent, the uh, uh, hyperbolic tangent, which goes from minus one to one, is really the one that can introduce some information into the memory cell. Uh, and that's why, conceptually, to, to distinguish between them, you can think of the sigmoid gate deciding when we are going to do something, to introduce something in the memory cell, and with the, uh, with the other uh, tangential, uh, which is like the sigmoid, but plus, uh, from uh, minus one to plus one, we decide what. The division is not that pure, because both of them are doing a, a little bit of both, but uh, if you want to simplify a bit too much the, the concept, then you can think of one decided what, when to write, the other what to write. Uh, well, and this one I have been explaining it before. We modify, forget, and input uh, according to those other gates. And then what do we do? So that was for the memory cell. What do we do for the hidden state? So for the hidden state, because we are not so worried about writing on it many times, uh, then we simply apply, so we decide what part of the memory cell or, or what transformation of the memory cell we are going to put into the next hidden state. And with the previous hidden state concatenated by x, we decide when we are going, or for which units we are going to introduce new information, a new linear or nonlinear transformation from the, from the uh, memory cell. Yeah, so any question about uh, LSTM? Yeah, good? Okay, okay. And then you will say, and why this very complicated method? Because it seems to be very irregular, the whole architecture. Why don't we make it more regular? Well, that has, the, there are the cases that there are many, many different alternatives of how to control the access to the memory cell and, and exactly how to do it. Uh, uh, and, and the other alternative to LSTM that is quite common is what they call the group. And the group is simply a small modification. Uh, so we, we simply replace, rather than using a memory cell and a hidden state, we use only a single hidden memory state. So, so uh, we unify both states. And the other chain is that we also unify uh, some of the gates. So what we end up having is a, uh, so you have again some wiring that looks again complicated, but in reality it is quite simpler. Because rather than having a forget an input gate, you only have an update gate, which decides, because in, if you realize of the symmetries in the equation in the LSTM, then why, the, there will be many times the situation when you tell the neural network to forget a memory cell, a, a neuron in a memory cell, but then if the input, uh, the, the, the input value of the input gate for that neuron is not one, then you are not going to put anything new into the memory cell. So forget, imagine for neuron two, forget gate is equal to one, so you are forgetting the memory cell, the neuron uh, of memory cell, the neuron two of the memory cell, and imagine that the input gate is also equal to zero, then you are not putting anything into, uh, into uh, neuron two of the memory cell, and that to some that might look like a, a waste of the impressional resources. To others it might look like useful, because in some occasions it might be useful to simply not have any information in certain cells, in certain neurons uh, of, the, of the neural network. Uh, so what they did here was simply to unify them by forcing the forget gate to be equal to one minus the input gate, or the other way around such that you do both things. Always that you forget uh, a, a neuron, you introduce something new as well. And if you want to introduce something new in a neuron, you forcibly forget whatever there, there was before. And then there is the reset gate, that uh, what it does is, is also to see if we add any extra information to the, uh, to the new hidden state or the new uh, memory cell. And then you apply and and there are some other, some other little uh, transformations, like the one, the main one that I am not mentioning, is that you don't have a separated hidden state and memory cell. You, you simply have a single, uh, a single internal representation. Uh, 
Yeah, okay. So, uh, so this is what I was talking about before. So uh, for uh, recurrent, uh, recurrent neural networks, it is more difficult to, to uh, be able to preserve the information from time step to time step. The LSTMs and the groups are able to solve uh, most of the vanishing gradient and the, and the exploding gradient problem, but they are not able to really solve all the problems that there are. So, and the, the rules of the home, the, the home take message is that it is useful to start first with the LSTM because it seems to be what tends to be a bit more robust. Uh, and if something, uh, if you want to see if the GRU is going to be more efficient in your example, which not always is, but sometimes it is, you can give it a try. Um, it is a bit frustrating, but this is the case with most of uh, neural networks because we don't have a strong theory of how they work and why they learn. And then we were talking a lot about the, the vanishing gradient problem, but does it happen in it is simply an NLP problem? Well, it is an especially important in NLP because of the recurrent neural networks, but it happens everywhere, also uh, outside, outside NLP. Not so strong, but it also happens. So in field forward neural networks, uh, like using vision and so on, uh, we also have this problem. And they have some other tricks uh, to, to use in feed-forward neural networks. With some of them conceptually, they are exactly the same as we are doing in the record neural network. For instance, residual connections, uh, a ResNet neural network, which if you use Python or TensorFlow, you can um, download and use the, the predefined famous ones. What it does is, it does a little bit like the memory cell, but without any gate. What it does is to jump certain layers and for instance give to layer number 10 also the values that you have in layer number 7 and that way the backpropagated gradients are able to skip some of the linear transformations uh, that tend to produce uh, vanishing gradients uh, and then batch normalization is another one so batch normalization tends to work always very well what it does is to foster, well I don't have the sigmoidal drawn any, anymore, but what it does is to foster the inputs of the uh, transfer functions to go towards the uh, input equal to zero, because that's where you have the highest gradient. These are not the only, the only solutions. These are not the only solutions. There are other ones, uh, another one that uh, with a very nice uh, theoretical paper they were able to show that it, it works well is being very careful with the initialization. In traditional neural networks, they use it to initialize everything to zero or to some happy function without much argument of why to do so. But then they realize some, uh, some more theoretical, or people using more theoretical arguments, they realize that there are certain ways of uh, introducing the, the, um, the initial values. You can do it with a normal distribution or a standard distribution, but if you set the standard deviation of those distributions, random distributions, equal to, I think it was two divided by fan in and fan out, which is the number of inputs and outputs, or equations of that type, then you are able to preserve much better the variance from one, uh, from one step to, from one layer to the next, and that seems to help a lot learning as well. Also, better activation functions, so before we were seeing that one of the problems uh, that uh, fosters uh, vanishing gradients is the fact that the sigmoid function, which everybody loved in the 80s and 90s, uh, has very low gradient, always lower than one. So there are some very radical other uh, different functions, like the ReLU, which is totally zero uh, for domain smaller than zero, and after domain x equal to zero, it starts growing with gradient equal to one, exactly one. It is that simple. And it grows, it is quickest to compute, and it, it works, uh, it tends to work, well, it works way better than, uh, than the um, sigmoid. Other one is leaky relu. I have to change that, there is a mistake. Uh, there is a leaky relu, uh, which rather than zero below zero, it has a little slope. Elu, which is a bit softer. Usually the rule of thumb here is that um, the worst transfer functions tend to be the sigmoids, except if what you want to do is a gate, like in the LSTM. The next worst is the tangential function, because at least you have negative values uh, in the output. 
next one Relu and next one Elu. Uh, that, that tends to be the way in which uh, people rate them. And then gradient clipping, uh, they also use it in feed-forward neural networks. Then other, other ways in which they call these tricks is dense net. So dense net is a bit like a ResNet. Uh, what it does is every few layers you simply allow top layers to connect to the lower ones. And then the high wide net, it is exactly or very, very much the same idea than the, than the LSTM, but rather than doing it uh, in different steps of the recurrence, you do it in different layers. So what you do is that the, you allow any layer of the neural network to uh, have access to previous layers, but you control that access through a number of gates. So these, these different THC, they are gates like we have in LSTM. Uh, okay, and then another trick. This one is quite simple. So we were talking, so all the examples that we have been, been giving here is a recurrent neural network that goes from, from, let me see, uh, from left to right when they are reading text or when they are reading an audio signal or anything. But why? But in reality, the correlations, the information correlation between what we are writing now in this course and what happens uh, outside that world, they not, there are not only correlations with words that we wrote before, there are also correlations that with words that we write later. So it is also very beneficial to, to put a, another, a, another layer kind of in parallel to, to the, the left to right reading layer that reads from right to left. And it does exactly the same computations, but in the other direction. It reads from, from, uh, from back to front. And then the only thing you do to keep computing or conceptually is that you concatenate the results, and that's it. Uh, and people, so this is in equations, it is extremely easy. You have two recurrent neural networks. One, one of them reads from one direction, the other one reads from the other direction, but uh, both of them end up having access to, to, to both of them, so to speak. So there is a lot of uh, transfer of information between one and the other. Or, no, no, sorry, sorry. That, that architecture is not the standard one. In the standard, in every step within this layer, they don't access the other. But in the next layer of the neural network, in multi-layer recurrent neural networks, they can have, have access to each other. Uh, okay, and you represent it like this. Uh, of the modern language model architectures like BERT, uh, they use this bidirectional approach because it almost always or always improves a bit performance. Um, yeah, and the next idea, okay, so that was well about the bidirectional uh, recurrent neural network. Any question? Everybody happy? Good. Uh, again, you can stop me if, if there is anything funny. Uh, yeah. So the next step is, okay, so we, are, we have a neural network, a recurrent neural network with many steps in time, with many layers in time, but why don't we also add layers in the perpendicular direction, in the, in the top direction, like we do in vision and in many, many other examples? And yeah, we can perfectly well do that. So what we can do, and, and, and you don't have any problem in the equations, it works perfectly well, is that besides the, the, the uh, recurrence in the time dimension, we can really stack a second recurrent neural network on top of it, uh, and then yet another on top of it, and as many as we want. And the gradients, when you want to calculate, for instance, the gradient of the loss with respect of this uh, hidden state, with respect, or, yeah, with respect to this hidden state, you can very well back propagate from here to here through all the different possible uh, possible steps, and it's totally doable. Uh, thanks to the backpropagation algorithm, because you temporarily store the gradients in each neuron, you don't really have a crazy uh, overhead in computation. Uh, yes, um, yeah, and something that shows that still vanishing and exploding gradients are still a bit of a problem, uh, in recurrent neural networks is that if you try to stack many on top of each other, you cannot go too high. So in vision, you can have like 50 layers or more. 
but uh, and it keeps working better and better, especially if you are Google and you have a lot of, of servers. Uh, but uh, in simple uh, multi-layer neural networks, you, you saturate the performance quite quickly with a few layers. There is the other architecture, uh, which is the transformer, uh, recurrent neural network, BERT, uh, which is the most famous of them, but there are also UML fit and some of the peripheral ones, GTP2, that are able to manage these problems and other problems that we still don't even know uh, much better, such that they are able to work better with even more layers. And yeah, that's it. So the take home message is that LSTM and, uh, and, and groups are able to solve uh, most of the problems that the recurrent neural networks have. Uh, LSTM seem to be, seems to learn better, but groups are faster to compute and to learn. Then to avoid exploding gradients, click the gradients and it tends to work quite well. Uh, use bidirectional neural networks, they always work uh, always better than, than the uh, unidirectional. And then use also uh, multi-layer neural networks if you have enough data. And that's it. You have some papers with some information of what we are talking, we have been talking about. And that's everything for this first hour. So now we are going to make a little break, uh, and then we will go to the next one. Any question, by the way, about the first one? Okay. <coughs> 